Welcome to the third episode of the Artist Podcast. What we have for you today is a conversation between me and Charlie. It started off as a conversation about net art, but slowly developed into just basically us talking and having a nice conversation about a lot of different things. We touch on um, currencies inside of video games and hosting exhibitions online. So um, thank you for listening. We're going to start off with Charlie giving a quick rundown of what exactly net art is. Uh, yeah, so according to Artistry, uh, a popular art website, posting on art refers to a current trend in art uh, and criticism concerned with the impact of the internet uh, on art and the different cultures it's created. So basically, posting in art is art created in the same sort of stem as net art, but after maybe 2009. Right, net art was a collective, wasn't it, in the 90s, net.art. Uh, it was it was a piece of net art essentially. It was um, I mean you could say it was a collective, but I'm pretty sure it was just um, a place where net art was stored, in the sense of where, that's where people uploaded their work to. Oh, was net art, net dot art just like a, a website? It was though. basically just a forum of different art pieces. Right. Um, uh, what's your opinion on on net art? Oh, internet art. Um, internet art, net art. I mean, they're pretty much the same thing. Um. I'm I'm not too I mean, clued up I'm, on the subject, so I, I'm looking to you to I mean, help me out here. Net art and internet art and post internet art and whatever else you want to call it is pretty much all the same thing. It's just it's different art forms on from different media's all pretty much evolving around either internet as a culture, as in like meme culture or basically read it and stuff my uh, understanding of it is it would be art that exists influenced by the aesthetic of the internet and well, and, yeah, what yeah. and um pretty much life after the millennium um ramped up capitalism and the such and just mass production and stuff like that which also stems from different internet things <laughs> things um would you be able to give us an example of a internet art piece um, pretty much anything that John Raffin's done it would be considered as internet art. If anyone, if you've heard of him, he yeah uh, yeah I've heard. he was famous for um, taking images from Google Maps, which was I think a piece that he's still working on to this day. But he started back in I think it was two thousand eleven or earlier or something like that. It was is that, is um, that Nine Eyes? It's called I believe the piece. I think so. Yeah. Uh, it was, um, he basically just used a Google Maps as a, a camera and he just went around taking photos through that. And I think he was the first person, or he may not have been the first person, but he was the the person who created it as a medium and people have replicated it and copied it. And What's this, using, using Google Maps as um, photography? Pretty much, yeah. Just using Google Maps Street View where you can take infinite photos of anyone. I know that um, Mishka Hemet used it in a similar way. He'd go to uh, like tropical countries with, um, in fact, if I prostitutes on the sides of of the the street, basically, and he'd, okay. he'd play like the bird sounds of that country over prostitution, basically happening as like a sort of juxtaposition between like the the natural uh, noises and obviously the dirtier human undertones of of that country. Yeah. Oh, that was a thing. But internet art doesn't necessarily have to be um, focused around the internet, in a sense. It could be sculpture or video pieces and stuff like that. It normally, as long as it has like a certain aesthetic, it could be described as internet art. Yeah, I, I, but, isn't that what post-internet art usually refers to? Creating um, something that's influenced by the internet's aesthetic in a tangible space? Essentially, yeah. I mean... All sort of stems from the same sort of beginning, I guess you could say. Um, net art influence, internet art, and post internet art is just an influence of internet art. But I'm pretty sure if you show, if I could show you a piece from any of them different, you'd just say it was all the same sort of. Chemical. Yeah, it, it's all like a hive mind sort of a collective yeah. of of work. I I can understand that. Well, I guess you get that with any sort of movement. It's. Well, it's just the case of it. So I feel like with the internet, the way it is nowadays, is that everything's so mass-produced in the sense of like if a if a trend gets popular, much like 
reference Google Maps piece. I mean, the amount of artists that I've seen copy and replicate that and use it in different different means, but essentially just stemming from the same the same pieces, then everything just sort of overlaps. And I suppose the only real difference is the time, I guess you could say, or the the added ramp of yeah. the amount of people creating internet art, just because the means of it's easy to produce essentially. Not to discredit anyone that makes it. I know one of my favourite artists, Cory Archangel, makes a bunch of pieces that are just using paint gradient tool and he makes these like rainbow effects that obviously would take two seconds and paint realistically. I mean you need to pre- select the rainbow tool, press the gradient once and then it creates these pieces of art and I feel like he's the first person to create these and blow them up massive and then like exhibit them on like flat screen TVs and then make them an aesthetic. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I've, I've seen I've seen them pieces. It's when he had he had like skiing glasses next to them, didn't he? The uh, yeah, 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 like yeah. the vibrant sort of coloured ones. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that comes as well a lot with um, especially more recent, say post twenty fifteen, internet art pieces. Are generally trying to stay away from the internet in the sense that they they're trying to create a space, an installation um, space, so it's more of a. Um, I'm trying to think of the word, more of a engaging piece in the sense that it's the whole room would be used to create a piece. I know John Rathman does that a lot when he'll create like um, a Mima's sort of bedroom and he'll make like a horrible computer desk with loads of food and Mountain Dew all over it and stuff like that and loads of anime and create like um, a piece in the space, if you get me. Yeah, yeah. He's had some insane sized shows as well though, hasn't he? Like, he's one of the people who gets commissioned to put on, like, big exhibitions. I feel like he's definitely one of the people who you'd point to and say, this guy is posting an art. Yeah, it, it, yeah. It, the same as, like, him and Hito Sterl. Her work could be... Did you go... You didn't go to the Venice Biennale that we all went to when we seen her work. And you you, all, you went in a, in a room. It was just a big black room with, like, blue neon, neon lights around it that made it all, like, sort of grid-shaped. And then... Okay. The, you all laid on sun lounges and you watched a movie she'd made in the corner and it was like the most surreal. It was like being in Tron. <laughs> like, oh, really? That's cool. Yeah, that's cool. it, was, it was good. Um, oh, yeah, I can see it. That's cool. Oh, so it was actually like, it looks almost 2D. Or is that the 3D creation of it? it what's this? No, it looks, it looks like you're in a 3D render. Oh, no, no, that it, is the piece. No, it's crazy. I'm looking at it now. It's, uh, it's insane. <laughs> yeah. I've read a lot of Hito's. Um, essays and stuff like that so I'm familiar with that work the internet's, uh, would you say the internet's doing yes. really good um, things to work at the moment especially with lockdown <laughs> it's, it's... I mean, with, with lockdown yeah I mean it's definitely given people there's still the ability to create and produce art I know a couple of people that are planning shows and I, I'm planning one with, with Gemma at the moment with um, we were going to host a um uh, a real a real exhibition uh, as a video sort of real uh, maybe some installs and stuff like that in Middlesbrough uh, we were going to host it in Pineapple Blackboard uh, we'll have to wait and see what's happening with that I mean we don't even know when lockdowns going to be over so instead we said to the people that we'd uh, originally commissioned for the open call to uh, see if they wanted their pieces exhibited online on um, on Twitch or maybe on YouTube. All right. And then, so we're going to have the videos going for 24 hours. I'll just run it off my computer at home and then just have the videos playing and then you can jump in whenever and I'll just have a a, a video at the end maybe with all the videos all in one type of thing with like uh, number cards and where you can view them type of thing. That works. But I was thinking maybe, I don't know whether I'd be able to, but learning how to create like a 3D space, sort of like the space that you mentioned with the heat or sterols where it's chairs in a room viewing a screen so maybe i could do an install in the screen in the sense of like 3d you could sit at a, at a chair and watch the screen if you get me i, you I, watch I, the, I uh, don't know if i do fully get you on that one <laughs> in the sense do you know like how um, on a 3d video yeah and sometimes it's not actually a 3d video it's just a screen inside a 3d realm right yeah yeah i get you yeah. yeah, I was thinking maybe you could do something like that. So we're almost implementing um, a video in a 3D space. Except, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
But I, I, I think there's galleries that do do that, where they make a three D space to do an exhibition in. Where oh yeah, definitely yeah. It's it's well, like, a clever idea. There's nothing yeah. to stop you from like live streaming, like setting up the show and live streaming the actual show. Mm. Well, I mean that's what um, I know. I know a couple of people from Leeds that do that on Blender. They'll they'll go into a space or they'll use I don't know just their own sort of imagination and create a space where the first room will be like paintings, the second room will be like sculptures. So the artists that create the the art space will have to look at the sculptures that are going in, scan them, and then recreate them in Blender, and then make sure they sit properly, and then have a, a camera sort of trail that you can go everywhere with, as you know, as opposed to like say Google Maps where you can go from one place to another. They'll yeah. have a camera set up so it goes three D everywhere in the sense that you can go pretty much anywhere. So it feels like you're well, like there. WSD, just sort of yeah, yeah, strolling yeah, about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can imagine uh, it's it being cause... a lot more awkward than that because of the way Blender's made, made it's not really like a, a viewing tool. But... Can't, can't you stick it on Unreal technology? <laughs> Just, uh... To be fair, suppose, <laughs> yeah, and if you learn how to create g- a games, you could essentially make a game where you could view people's art in yeah. a video game realm. I'm surprised I haven't already heard of that, to be fair. but I know. It's, it, well, it, I guess you can think back to old games like LSD Dream Emulator. Where that that was basically just a concept art piece. That was Wait, just a trip. <laughs> yeah, you're just walking through like a three D trip on the PlayStation yeah. One. That's crazy. I'm surprised that I haven't seen. Uh, to be fair, there probably is a lot of uh, students that use that as an art piece and then just screenshot that and then be like, "This is my art." But I'm surprised that hasn't been picked up by like a per- like a person like Rafman or he owned said like a mid massive. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, they're not going to be able to find a copy of it, are they? <laughs> Well, no, the copies go. I think copies go for about five hundred dollars yeah. on eBay. So it's mental. Well, that's, that's, You'll that's be able to emulate it on a, a PlayStation oh, One. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, emulator. But I suppose if someone of a bigger artist just picked it up, they'd probably just make their own. I know a lot of people. Well, yeah, a lot of people. I know a lot of artists that are in the realm of posting that art. Use, um, do you know, the old. I think it was like a noughties game. Was it Second Earth or Two Earth? What was it called? Second Life. Second they, life. Second life. People create. Like, I think it's still going. Board. That you know, man. Like. Is it really? Yeah. I cause... remember watching. There's a documentary on uh, on Netflix. I think called Second Life. Well, it was. I don't know if it still is. This is it the one uh, about the cult inside of us. No, it wasn't about a cult. It was about. <laughs> uh, it was three different stories from different people that had been affected when this glitch had hit. Right. Um, pretty much revealing who they were or something like that. It was the first one was the person who used to run a shop on there who sold unique. Like pretty much, she was the Gucci of Second Life on her server. So there she was... created like her own unique bags and stuff like that. No, that was it. The glitch ruined her life. She was living at home, I think, in the basement of her mum's basement in the center. And that was her form like, of revenue. Making... She was she a nerd, yeah. And her revenue was selling bags or selling dresses online. And someone, the glitch, like revealed their cord or something like that, so people could mass produce her items. So it pretty much plummeted her stock, and then she had nothing. Yeah, um, she could just one, make more exclusive I mean, you ones. Could make more, but then why would you pay this, like her higher prices? Say, I mean, I, I'm just gonna pull this number out of my head. If you pay three pounds <laughs> for a for a pair of shoes that are unique, and then you could go next door, and they're the same shoes there. I mean, this is pretty much pre mark and you, you go this find the same shoes, but more of a knockoff, and then you can get them for cheaper. You're gonna go for the cheaper one just because it's cheaper and it's a video game in a sense. Oh uh, yeah, I wouldn't pay money for shoes. I think in, in a video one, game. <laughs> well, I would. Was, it's uh, a lie. I, I bought a husky on Fall King's Casino. I don't know what that means. It's it's a <laughs> online, it's a gambling game on the PS4. What? It's like the, yeah, it's like the worst. It's the worst. It's the worst game ever. But like. Oh, oh, me and my friends oh, play Port. Husky. Yeah, virtual husky. Oh, okay. it, it wasn't expensive. It was like four quid. But he, he follows me around in the casino now. So when I play poker with my mate, I got a little husky. What is it like a three D poker? I've never even heard of it. It's a three D casino, isn't it, mate? It's completely free to play, mate. Me and our mates good, play, play a lot of it, even yeah. though it's like not particularly any good, like at all. That'd be something interesting. I'm, I quite like gambling, but don't like losing money, so I never do. Oh, it is good gambling. <laughs> oh, so you, you so you 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 do gamble real money or no no you don't you can pay for extra chips but you get a certain amount yeah. of chips and that and if you win we usually play the free poker and if you win that you get five thousand coins and then you can go play real poker. Well, but that the, seems very cool. To be fair. I have to Google that. 
it is good, but it does. It, talk, going back to what we were talking about, what, what had to do with art. Um, <laughs> oh, so I was talking about Second Life. There's a, there's a, the other person on uh, Second Life was um, was a person who had been exposed because their the character got leaked. They, they were playing as like a a ten year old girl, and they were friends with all these other ten year old girls, and it seemed pretty, you know, just like a kid on on Second Life just playing a game, like sort of like Habbo Hotel was. Right, but yeah. then it re- it's revealed that like the, the player character is this like forty year old guy who's not like who's not weird. I mean he's got a wife and kids and stuff and he doesn't look like crazy or anything like that. He just has this fetishization of being like a young little girl. So this is the only way he could do it type of thing. And then they were trying to the documentary was like him trying to come to terms with not being this little girl and he, he stopped playing for a month and then he was like having like do you know, like how someone who was stopped taking heroin has like withdrawals withdrawals and withdrawals yeah pretty much yeah so he just kind of went crazy and then just sort of was like right I'm going to have to keep playing it so like, <laughs> like, I'll, I'm going to have to leave you really and they hosted like a ceremony on on the second life of him coming back and all his friends were like celebrating and hugging like kissing and stuff like that he used to play I think he quit his job at that point as well I think if anything the documentary made it worse because he was living like fine with it playing I don't know within the, the means of his, his doing it and his, then his wife was like you either give it up because of the documentary or are you coming back yeah imagine like if, if you mind. if your like wife got outed doing something like that on like national TV and yeah. then <laughs> you had to come to terms with it you probably would ask them to stop like yeah. he probably said, stop being a little girl online on Second Life. Have you even played Second Life before? I've downloaded it, but I couldn't get into it. I, 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 pref- it. I preferred yeah. IMVU. That was that was better. I preferred Runescape. Oh, I'll look, yeah. don't get me Runescape. started. On Runescape. Have a Runescape. Hotel. World of Warcraft. That's a one. Bang. <laughs> we can talk a bit about the lockdown. Playing a lot of World of Warcraft if you want. I've I've <laughs> played seventeen hours in the past four days. Really? That's yeah. In the past, uh, in the past month, I've played um, probably about eighty hours. Eight, so really? Played more than me. Yeah. I don't think that maths works out, Murph. No, but I mean, in, in the span of like four days, you played seventeen hours. So in me. Ah, yeah, it does yeah. You, yeah, you kept up the pace. You'd be on a hundred and fifty hours or so in, in thirty days. <laughs> so. Yeah. Up more than me. I, it's I'm, just I'm it, only slightly behind. Time goes so quickly playing that game, and especially with lockdown, there's been literally nothing to do. It doesn't feel like I'm wasting my time spending, you know, so many hours on World of Warcraft a day. Well, I, f- I feel inspired when I play World of Warcraft. I feel like there's definitely goals to be reached. Like, I get up every morning and literally have nothing else to do because I'm a retail worker and spend mo- like the rest of my time on social media anyway. So I wake up at like nine o'clock, I'll m- have breakfast, and then I'll sit and play World of Warcraft for two hours. And after then, I feel like I've accomplished part of the day. So then it'll push me on to doing other stuff, like yeah, stuff on Instagram or doing stuff for wet. Oh, I like doing stuff and then feeling like I, I can play World of Warcraft afterwards. Like this morning, I went for a jog. I, I jogged uh, four kilometers to the river, the Tees River. All right. And then um, I was like, I can't wait to come back and play World of Warcraft completely guilt free because I've already done something with my day. <laughs> yeah, but you're playing retail, why aren't you? You aren't. You aren't hitting the achievements like I am. No, I'm not playing. I'm, <laughs> playing, playing, the, I'm not playing the classic <laughs> the game, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, that documentary is Life 2.0, by the way. I, w- I, I will watch that, mate. I will. There's, there's I a vi- watched it a while ago. It's pretty, it's pretty good. There's a video on YouTube about a cult inside the game. I, I can't remember how it goes, but it's like hidden on a deep world and all that sort of stuff, and it, it, it is proper scary. The cult in the sense of, like, not like paedophiles, just like a cult. No, it's not nothing to do with that. just a, a weird cult. Like, you'll oh, have to watch it, mate. Just search cult in Second Life. People are, like, trying to track it down and see if it's still active today. Oh, really? Yeah, it's, uh, it's good. I was going to mention. Uh, have you noticed that, like, are you, are you doing more physical exercise now that lockdown's on than you were oh, before? Yeah. I feel like I have to. I feel like normally, obviously, I'm running back and forward from work and then I'm on my feet all day at work, like, 30 hours a week or more. So I feel like that, that keeps not the weight off me. But because I've just been sat at my computer all day, every day, I feel like I have to go, go out and exercise. Yeah. Or else I'll just pile on the pounds. <laughs> my, my Strava app, Strava's like an app which tracks where you run or where your bike ride. Oh, it's, yeah. it's went off it. Like, I've, I've just been on it all the time, posting like a new run every day. I suppose but, that's, that comes down to like wanting to do goals as well. Yeah, it is. It, it, there's, there's a solidarity. It's, it's called like solo derity. It's like a, a medal you get. If you get doing, if you do 10 hours of exercise, 
in like the past month and I've, I've only got 40 minutes left to go and it's completely an irrelevant challenge that means absolutely nothing it's like a badge okay. on your profile and I, I, I'm still like I'm encouraged to get it <laughs> I'm going to feel a sense of accomplishment like when I get this yeah. yeah it's good I found the artist that I was talking about earlier that was uh, doing work on Second Life and I, I'm going to butcher it because I don't know where uh, uh, but it's Skawetanati, I think, or something. I'm not too sure. Is, <laughs> is that two two names, or is that like a, an alias? It's just a really long name. Um, I, I believe Jar- Jared showed us them before in university, um, where it was like it, it was going like loads of weird fetish worlds and stuff like that. No, am I wrong? Right, we're back. Um, we had a bit of technical issues with the internet. <laughs> but in really, talking about internet art. Yeah. I suppose that's one issue with uh, creating work online is that there's always always issues you run into um, when it's online. Do you ever do you ever think about games like that, like Second Life and I M V U, where a lot of the um, the products inside the game are like generated by the users. And how it like it's an actual skill to have this three D modeling ability, and they they use it to make Pikachu T shirts, and they sell them for millions of pounds. I wonder if it is like a viable income. <laughs> like, I mean, it's it... definitely. I mean, from like like in two thousand and ten, someone was like I say, running a shop and living off that. I mean, they were living in the mother's basement, so. I mean, well, yeah, not what you will, but it's like they... the dr- dream place to live. It's my my aspirations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Making pieces, they were definitely making. Uh, say making pieces, making uh, p enough money to live on. So yeah, man. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely. I mean, there's economies and everything. I mean, I'm writing a piece currently on on RuneScape. Um, you must have heard about the uh, the Venice, the Venezuelans. Yeah, the bot is where literally the uh, the gold, the fake money inside of RuneScape is worth more than their current economy. Yeah, so uh, um, it's, sit it's for nine to five, just farming gold on RuneScape to just sell. It's the largest income for Venezuelan youth. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. I feel like that's just like it's such a it's, it's such like a, a clear in- illustration of like how bad like, uh, capitalism is in the sense of where people in the West are buying fake gold for real money <laughs> off poor people because they don't have the time. It's it's just crazy. Yeah. But I I was watching um a, uh, a YouTuber called uh, you've probably seen him, Sir Plugger. He yeah, I, I like Sir Plugger. On um, the lava cave, where it would cost, I think it's it's somewhere around three hundred to five hundred USD to get a lava cave. So instead of like grinding out the hours to do it, people just pay five hundred pound to for someone to just sit on their game for two hours and then beat this hard boss and then they get the lava cave. And I just feel that's just so stupid. I mean, I'm definitely um, into video games, but I don't know if I'd ever spend three hundred pound on a cape. <laughs> I'm definitely very interested in this whole currency inside of video games. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's, it's a crazy phenomenon. I mean, well, I, it, I don't know it, about you, but I've been pretty much living in that in World of Warcraft. I, when I first started playing it, I didn't I didn't uh, start level leveling properly until maybe like two weeks in, and I just spent my most of the time in the auction house, which. I suppose for anyone that doesn't know, is the equivalent of eBay, but on World of Warcraft, and it's what the the main economy comes from uh, inside the game. Um, and I was just I was um, stealing Flipping. cloth, <laughs> right, of, um, of like low level humanoids, turning that cloth into bags, and then <laughs> selling my bags, undercutting um, other people selling their bags to a point of where no one else was selling bags. At which point I owned the market. So then I started selling my bags for more. Um, and it's then people tried to keep underselling me. So I was buying out everyone else's low price bags that were trying to undercut my bags and then reselling them for more for my. And I was running that racket for a while. Running <laughs> run some price fixing inside of the World <laughs> yeah. of Warcraft. Yeah. That's yeah, mental. Uh... In real life, but... my, my, uh, my friend Ben um, used to play World of Warcraft Lords and he got his account hacked by like a Chinese hacking team or whatever. 
and um, yeah. he, he obviously reported it to Blizzard and he got his account back but the bonus was that it was full of gold because obviously they'd been oh, they were using far- it yeah they were farming gold off his account but when he got it back it was just stacked full of gold that's crazy. So it was like it was like oh it was class, it was yeah. class when I got hacked by these um these Chinese people and they, and they filled my account with gold. <laughs> How do you know they were Chinese people? I, I think it was just that, that that was the current uh that was like at the time who was sort of running the selling yeah. game at World of Warcraft because this must have been about a solid ten years ago. Yeah, I mean I haven't played I haven't played RuneScape for about a year now because the last time I logged on, uh, all my expensive items and gold have been stolen from me so now i have no urge at all to go back on it because i tried to complain to jagex and they were just like we can't prove anything so yeah it's on you type of thing so it's not hard to make money on a runescape but i guess you do need a bit you need money to make money don't you yeah it's quite just just go begging at the grand exchange going around saying and anyone give me free money Anyone give me free money. I've seen people do that on, on uh, different videos on YouTube and they just make a bank. Yeah, it's good, and isn't I it? I just don't it's understand just... how. But yeah, you should definitely look into more... Um, it's quite interesting, the, the economies of different video games because it's, it's the crazy lengths that people go to. I mean, there's, there's like... There's like um, they're called mafias on World of Warcraft, but I mean, they're, they're not mafias. They're just like gangs. Yakuza's. <laughs> yeah, essentially. They're just gangs of nerds that'll um, <laughs> they'll have <laughs> computers running and they'll, they'll have like a 24 hour setup where they'll have people from across the globe who can watch certain areas of the map because certain. Um, they're called black lotuses, which is like um, it's like a flower that spawns in, in the world of World Warcraft, of Warcraft. And they, they drop every one to three hours in 30, I think it's 30 or 40 different locations across the, like the map. So they have people sat on it like every hour of the day that across the globe type of thing, just in case one spawns, they can pick them up. Right. They sell for 200 gold, which I think it's the equivalent of about 10, 10 US dollars. So, what well, that's how much have, was worth, uh, gold's how, worth I think, in World I think 100 gold's worth about 5 USD. That's not bad, that is it. Is that, so, do you reckon they made them in reference to the Black Lotus? Um, the, the Magic the Gathering card. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. They made, them, made them worth a load of money. Yeah, definitely. It's used in, like, a final gear. It's like a, like a final raid. It's used as, like, a portion to help towards that. So pretty much in, I don't know, I think it's in, like, three months, the final raid next Ramus will be released on World of Warcraft Classic, and that'll be... Everyone will want the Black Lotus, and the prices will probably skyrocket. Skyrocket. Like, so like 400 gold. Worth so looking for them. They, they reckon that lots of lots of like these mafias um will be sat on like loads of them waiting for the next uh, raid to be released and then they'll flip them for like three times as much that is good for people who don't... Sell, but then they'll sell the gold illegally to like a like a gold farming company that will sell that gold to like different people and they'll make however much money off that and then yeah. share it between people of the of the mafia <laughs> i like that i like that they call themselves the mafia I, um, to pe- I feel like I don't get why people haven't used that as a, as, as a piece of art before because it's so interesting. I don't get why no one's ever like really Pe- spoke about it. I suppose people don't really have that much interest. Um, I, I obviously our generation likes stuff like that and we find it interesting. But if you imagine trying to explain a topic like this to um, like an old woodworking teacher or someone who you'd find at exhibitions, yeah, sure. I suppose I suppose you probably <laughs> you'd struggle to keep them interested. I suppose. You would, if they have would, no like experience with like, they'd be like, what are you talking like about? That. Yeah. <laughs> back in my day. Back, yeah, back in my day, <laughs> we hit yeah, wood but... with metal and made sticks. <laughs> and we presented them and made millions. Yeah. <laughs> we built back a bench. The, the art world wasn't oversaturated. Yeah. But That's true. Do you know? Tell you what, the, was... my favorite currency is Counter Strike. Oh my god, Counter Strike! I can watch people open up Counter Strike boxes looking for <laughs> knives all day. It's it, it's fantastic. It's I feel like I don't know. I'm not sure. I feel like uh, loot boxes and the like should definitely be banned. I mean, they've definitely been tried to be banned in the UK a couple of times, but they sell them on. Know. They sell. Well, just crazy. Don't they sell them on the game now? What do you mean on the game? Don't they sell loot boxes inside of the game? Like you can buy keys to open up loot boxes. In Counter Strike, yeah, you've always yeah. had to do that. Yeah, that's it's. Uh, cla- I, I was love- talking more about. Um, I mean, Counter Strike's got its own problems, especially with like. I skin hub. What was that whole scandal with the whole skin hub? No, it wasn't skin hub, was it? Syndicate and the other guy. 
Who were oh, like, what they were promoting um, the scam doing, sites. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah, they were like selling off like gambling sites to kids and stuff like that. But I feel like, I mean, I get this from like working with a couple of lads that I, um that are obsessed with FIFA and they use like FIFA packs as their like it's that's their fix in the sense of where like they spend probably about three thousand to five thousand pounds a year on, on FIFA, FIFA packs. on the ultimate that team. Just, that just blows my mind. Did it? Did it? You don't get anything on that game on FIFA. I, I'm, I'm like, I do spend a bit on it as well. I like at the start of the year when the game comes out, and you never get anything. You'll spend thirty pound and get absolutely nothing, like at all. You need to bump the numbers up to five thousand. The like problem is, <laughs> even if you do get something rare, it's worth nothing the year after. With Counter Strike, if you open up one of them, them crates to get like the crimson, is it the crimson web? Is that what it's called? The I'm dagger sure. that's worth about three, three thousand oh, yeah, pound. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Then at least you've got that on your account forever, and it's only ever going to go up in price until obviously a counter strike that, becomes obsolete, with, which mean, it might never. It never will. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the the so throw by nature of um, of FIFA. I don't get like I mean it comes out every year. Why do people buy it every year? I, I, I understand two years. I understand why they build it every year. I buy it every year because obviously it's updated with the entire. No, I understand why they do it, but I don't. I, I don't feel. I feel like. People shouldn't um, shouldn't encourage EA <laughs> to do that sort of thing. I mean, like, I think it's pretty. I'm pretty sure it's like eighty percent of EA's revenue just comes from FIFA. Packs yeah, Ultimate Team. Yeah, it's crazy. Which is, which is crazy. It's sh- it shows like h- how we are as humans, and we're addicted to gambling. Yeah, and we I, get, I, we I get, feel get, like that shouldn't be definitely. It definitely shouldn't be promoted to kids. Get yeah, get them started at a young age buying Ultimate <laughs> yeah. Team packs. Oh, but um, there was rumors like a year or two ago that. FIFA was going to start being a subscription, so it just updated yearly, yeah, that'd, it, like that'd, monthly. That makes sense. That'd be more of a. I, I don't think I'd, I'd, do I'd, do it, it was just a rumor. Pounds on it once every year, or would you rather spend one hundred and ten? Um, ten pounds. Well, I know what EA would prefer. So. Oh yeah, <laughs> I mean, I know what EA would prefer. I suppose yeah, if that was the only way to get your FIFA fix. It was to subscribe to it. People I don't know, it's just annoying. Just suppose that to like something like Overwatch, where Blizzard were like, "Oh, it's it's going to be twenty pound, and every month you can play for two weeks for free, and the loot boxes are only cosmetic, and it, it, it doesn't make a difference, and blah blah blah." And oh, Overwatch Two is coming out next year, and it's free to everyone that bought it the first time round because you know why wouldn't it be? It's the same game, but then EA just does the opposite and charges. Fifty pound, sixty pound every year for the same game. I mean, it's not the same game. I know it's updated, but they could definitely run with the twenty twenty one or the twenty nineteen one. Yeah, and it, just use that for two, three years. I mean, the graphics don't improve that much, but I don't know. Yeah, I I, I buy it every year. I like it. I, I I it's good for the first couple of weeks because you get excited to buy the new game and play with your mates again. I played this yeah. one for the first two weeks like solid, and then I didn't. I I. I I would have traded it in, but I got I bought it digitally. If you know what I mean, so anyone, screwed, screwed you, myself over on that one. Have you ever heard of anyone making um, FIFA art? No, it's, it's not an aesthetic game, is it? You, you need. I suppose not. No. And, it doesn't fit the realm of what people who subscribe to post it are. Yeah, um, I, I suppose in the sense of. Are yeah. interested in. I feel like posting an art definitely tries to make itself as an ulterior alter, um, I'm trying to think of the right term like an like um, an alt version of traditional art in the sense of like people make art nowadays um, make it say, say like a painting or a sculpture or something like that uh, or they'll even make a video but then I can imagine someone who creates posting an art as being like someone who thinks of themselves as um, an alter ego sort of sense to that in the sense that they'll make like traditional art but they'll do it through the internet so it's new and cool and different and has aesthetic yeah i i, I, I understand what you mean what you mean i i'm i, I'm, I'm, I'm I was terribly yeah you struggled a bit there didn't you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i knew where i was going but i just couldn't couldn't, no, couldn't visualize the word it's all right mate so i was like i got stuck mid-sentence and things just start to like trickle out <laughs> yeah. I, I'm like, what, you am I spo- what am I supposed to be saying now? <laughs> like, I've, <laughs> yeah. I've started this sentence, I don't know where it's going. <laughs> um, you just start going, um, um, hey. um I understand though, when I, when I first started getting in, interested in uh, 
Into uh, Charlie, it's Echo. Go. I understand uh, what you mean because when I first started getting interested in uh, internet art when I was in university about five years ago, it's because it was something that appealed to me as like something that was relevant to my generation. It, it <clears throat> a lot of artists who came and talked like they did fantastic work, but it wasn't something that particularly caught my eye. The same way as work by Archangel did or when Mishka Henna came in like that they, they were all fantastic um but obviously in yeah, the art... it definitely fits something like I mean I know I'm interested in that and stuff like that um but I feel like it definitely fits in some like aesthetic of, of kids who grew up playing a lot of Xbox and it just looks cool it Warcraft. looks so much cooler than somebody I remember <laughs> there was an artist who came in once and she what she did is she got she found metal on a beach and wrapped it in cloth and left it out, and then the metal would make paintings on the cloth, and I just thought, like, why? I don't, I don't give a shit. I don't care. <laughs> I, I don't know, not at all. I, I, it's the nice. That's nicey, nicey art for like. Yeah. People. Traditional art. Yeah. I yeah. Mean. So. What would it's you in, say in, that inoffensive. Um, better or worse over the years, or. It's just, everyone's making it now. It's just a meme, isn't it? It it exists in uh, anywhere you look. If you know. It, Stuff like deep fried memes or in an art, because you, you have to have a certain like understanding in in your head to actually understand what's going on when you see something that says like, uh, "Let me let me think." <laughs> You're trying to try like, to explain a deep fried a, a, meme. A, 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 like a, a, like a loaf of bread on a chair. And it'll say like bread chair, bread chair. <laughs> and then it'll just be deep fried. And it'll be funny. It's like. It's, what do you have to say? Because it's a comment on our <laughs> culture and how yeah we understand what bread chair. What bread chair means in it? So what to, makes, what, what's the difference between uh, memes and internet art? Then, or is it, is it not a difference at all? What makes a difference between so I get a person who's claiming themselves an art as an artist making? Well, I say making. A, 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 like an artist say that I got paid to create this piece of art in a show, compared to a person who just makes memes online. I guess it's um, it's basically linking it to a persona. So as soon yeah. as you put a name to what you're making and you try to this is this is obviously like quite a difficult conversation because it's where you place it changes its meaning. So if you put it in a gallery, it could be art. But that's 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 what I made my final work about when I went to university. Is I try to discuss the difference between photography for advertisement and photography for um, artistic wow. purpose. Yeah, and that's where I what took. What conclusion did you come to? It's just the the purpose of it. So obviously, I I painted out the um, the logos and any any font. So it was just the photograph, and then hung it like on the wall, and then like in a, in a gallery space, and then it it changes it from an advertisement to art, and it's, the only difference is it's it's what it's made for, it, where its per its purpose has changed, it's been reappropriated to a different. I suppose the question then would be if art is moving towards more of a digital space in the sense of like creating these these fake galleries or on a video game where you can view videos and stuff like that, when does the memes and stuff like that then cross because then they're all on the same sort of space. I mean, I could post my art on Reddit and it could be next to a meme. So what would make my art different from the meme unless it's just the... It's just that's what you, know what you I mean? it's just what you made it for. You made it to be art and obviously it'll have certain attributes that you've put in purposely that make it art compared to the person who made it to be to be a meme. It's just yeah. what what it was made for is what it'll be. But anyone could perceive anything as anything. You could literally reappropriate the same image that is a meme into art, if you make any sense, by printing it out and putting it on a wall. Yeah. In so a, in you a, say that the only difference between not just on a wall, it'd have to be in, yeah, yeah, yeah. The intention. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, of oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck Where was I? <laughs> we were I'll just leave. I'll. I'll. I'll, 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 I'll then you I'll, started saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll leave it in. I thought you'd notice when I held the door shut. <laughs> Did you just start, start pushing? Why would you start pushing? I don't know. <laughs> 
Why would your mum start pushing on the door? Don't know. She must have thought there was a shoe in front of her or something. Like Don't let me in, I'm coming in. Should we go back to talking about video games? <laughs> <laughs> it's only a couple of hours. We can, we can cut to talk about something else. Do you reckon what we're doing now, making a podcast, is internet art? Um, I mean, yeah, definitely. I mean, I mean, I'm submitted it as a piece of a masters anyway, so I know I it's, so, it's, it's so jammy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I definitely say it is, it is. It is a piece of art. I mean, we're sat here with the intention to create it as a as a as a piece for people to refer to and to use towards their own practice. So why wouldn't it be considered as art? I know, yeah. I mean, I, as internet art it goes, I mean... It's yeah. as internet as it can get, isn't it? Would you say it was internet art? I'd say it was a podcast that... I would say it's art. I'd say anything that someone makes of creative intent, I, I like to refer to as art. I like to use yeah. that word very loosely. Um, I think we, we're making this with good intentions. We've got a couple of interviews lined up, and we've got two two in the next two weeks. So, do you want to say who they are? Or? Uh, we have Connor Clements from um, Dovetail Joints Galleries, and we have um, Charlie Howard and one of your friends. What was his his name again? Ben Sargent. Ben Sargent and Charlie Howard um, is an artist. And what what does Ben Sargent? Um, what does his work entail? Ben's an artist currently in Essex, but he runs. Um... Uh, like a music magazine and his own record label and his own art space. And so he's got like, that. yeah. A he's lot... one of them guys that's pretty clued in. P- pretty clued in. Got a lot going on. Yeah. That's good. Are we doing them together? Yeah, or... Charlie's like his uh... right hand guy type of thing. All right. So well, are we doing them together? We could do them together. I, I mean, I only asked him when I was playing Call of Duty earlier because he was asking <laughs> me about working on a piece with him. He wants me to um, help with, uh, I think he wants me to help. I mean, it's pretty. He asked me as he was leaving. He asked me if he if I wanted to get involved with. Um, um, they're doing like online crits, so they're hosting like their own sort of um, studio environment. I guess you could say it was uh, in the sense of like they're right. going to have other people join, and then they're going to discuss other people's works and pretty much what we're doing now. But I think in like maybe one or two sittings. So they get where so online crit, crit, like crit that you get in a university setting where you show off your yeah, work. That's what I'm saying like in like a studio environment where you just get your friends and artists round to discuss art and your art and yeah, I hate improving. I hated them, them so much. I just you hated I, them. yeah, I probably probably because you're making good work. I was making some shit at uni, like uh, so. so I, mean, I wasn't making good work at uni. I always used to just phone it in when it came to hand-ins more than anything. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm definitely one of the people that works where they'll make artwork about something and then, like, contextualise it afterwards, so... Right, so you'll make the work first. I think as soon as, as, soon yeah. as you made work that looked good, it was... You were pretty safe about, like, explaining it as well. But I just made... I mean, that's half of what art is, really. I mean, it depends on the person. I mean, I know people that work backwards to where I work. They'll, they'll think of an idea. idea theory and then have like a way to contextualize their ideas into like a literal form and then yeah. do it. Yeah. I, I understand. I used to just shit myself when it came to it. When it came to like just actually showing off your work and you had to contextualize it, I'd be like, what am I talking about here? This is absolute <laughs> abso- yeah. absolute waffle. And everyone's looking at you and it's like, what's he doing? <laughs> I quite enjoyed that. I mean I suppose I didn't really like I mean I don't really like talking to a group of people anyway. Um but I quite liked uh, discussing other people's pieces. I don't know why. I just kind of feel like it adds a lot to the uni, the, uni, the university experience with art and stuff like that. I feel like it's something that's definitely lacking now in Teesside University. From studying there for my masters, um, there's definitely a lack of, uh, I suppose, drive with the other students. I mean, especially with the third years. I mean, I don't, I don't know how it's going now with the whole lockdown. I mean, I know I've, I've heard that their their degree shows have been put on hold or they can't be. Doing right. their traditional means, and there's been a whole storm from what I've seen online of students just confused to what that what's going on, or should they pay the tuition fees? I mean, especially in some larger universities, like say like London, London. Um, I can't think it's big. There should be uh, reimbursement, I reckon, on fees in um, universities. Like anything, just postpone. I mean, like like I say, in like big London universities, like Goldsmiths and stuff, half of the price of going to their university is in the sense 
at the end of it, you have a big degree show, and if someone likes your work, like a, I don't know, say a scout. Boss, right. Okay. So scout. obviously, paying that um, to go to that certain university is obviously one of the larger points in why you would go there in the first place. Yeah, it's for the exposure of being in London. So especially when it comes to degree show, a lot of people are there, and if you're missing out on the opportunity of meeting, I don't know, potential work, you're going to be like, well, I've just wasted ten thousand yeah. pounds, if not more. <laughs> you know what I mean? So why wouldn't I want to postpone it so then that it can be not online? I suppose you could say. Yeah, no, I I hundred percent agree. Um, do you reckon that's a, a good point to wrap it up for today, then, Murph? Do you reckon we've? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Do you want Do you want um, tell the people what's going on? Do you have any any anything exciting in the pipeline? Um, just like I mentioned earlier, the uh, the video show maybe will start. I'm going to say the first week of June. I mean, I could be wrong, but I'm huh. going to aim for the first week of June to be done and ready for then. Uh, apart from that, I've got um, a an chapter ec- of my an, essay coming out around the same time. An exciting so new podcast with, you, with your good friend, Tom. And uh, another ex- exciting podcast will be next week. <laughs> so, I know. I, w- I, w- I wonder how it's going to go with Connor. I hope it goes well. He seems like a nice lad. I mean, so. yeah, I've met him a couple of times. I have as well uh, at like, exhibitions. Yeah. yeah. I-, I like that he reached out to me. I do. I, I appreciate that a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah so thank you all for listening if you've made it to the end you're an absolute champion um, mm. this is the end the of the one ep- person still listening my dad <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, thank you very much and goodbye did I say goodbye weird there <laughs> goodbye. a little bit yeah yeah I did, I did say that